Thanks for listening to A Long Time in Finance with Jonathan Ford and Neil Collins in partnership with Briefcase News, the service that brings intelligent curation and analysis to your media monitor. Hello and welcome to Long Time Shorts, a new series of shorter than usual episodes of A Long Time in Finance, each one of which gives you a quick hit of financial history from the debt jubilee of ancient Babylon to the latest crypto calamities. So, Neil, do you remember the thing recently, last year, I think it was, about uh, GameStop, that American company? That, ah, uh, yes, a business which was almost worthless, yep. allegedly. Yes, and it basically, the Wall Street sharks circled and started selling its shares short, selling them in the hope that they would go down and they could buy back the shares when they it seemed like a good one-way bet to yeah them. and then a group of a robin hood styled group of kind of young millennial kind of nutters ganged up informally supposedly and bought up the shares with the express view of destroying <laughs> the hedge funds that were in turn trying to destroy gamestop you remember that, that was, yeah. it was a very exciting yeah, it story was very fun very entertaining okay so today this is sort of an echo a distant echo of things that used to happen a long time ago in the stock market and it's a thing which is known as the, the i think they called the gamestop thing as squeeze on the shorts but yes. in the real kind of full fat version of that is a a corner where you literally try to buy up everything so that people who have sold short the stock can find no other source than you to buy it back. And then you are able to name your price and destroy them. So I'm going to take you back 100 years to the last great stock market corner, which was (laughs) of a magnificently named company called Piggly Wiggly Stores. And... (laughs) Piggly Wiggly Stores, and well, it sounds sort of comic, it was actually a, a remarkably far-sighted organisation. It was set up by a man called Clarence Saunders. He came from Memphis, Tennessee. So he was from a poor family. He worked his way up through the grocery trade. And at the end of the First World War, he set up a company, this company, Piggly Wiggly. And it did fantastically well. Do we know okay, why so, it did well? Well, because it was he was a business genius. He was a far-sighted figure. So at a time when most grocer stores were still you know, sort of a man in a white coat standing behind a counter in front of a pile of, you know, sacks of oats and things like that. He set up the first supermarket. He literally had goods on shelves, which you went round the store and you went through a checkout at the end. Indeed. You'd never catch on. Yeah, never catch on. Well, so the New York Times reported on it when it, when it went public, which is when, it, when this whole adventure starts. And they say, The customer in a Piggly Wiggly store rambles round aisle after aisle on both sides of which are shelves. The customer collects his purchases and pays as he goes out. Good Lord. Yeah, so this is uh, is novel stuff. (laughs) Piggly Wiggly grows very, very quickly. And in 1922, Clarence Saunders does what most entrepreneurs do, which is he thinks I must cash in a bit and he sells shares to the stock market. The shares do perfectly well. One key point to understand about Piggly Wiggly stores is Around half the stores, of the, I think there are 1,200 stores at the time it goes public, around half of them are directly owned and managed by Clarence himself. And the other half are franchises. He basically financed the creation of the company, really, by just selling franchises here and there. The other thing we need to know about him is he is very much a in the character of a classic Midwestern entrepreneur who's made his fortune so he's building an enormous house which he's called the pink palace in the middle of memphis <laughs> tennessee which is where he's from and it has a private golf club because oh, he, of course he loves golf i don't understand and how he managed to do without so he's quite ostentatious and the other thing is he sees himself very much as the honest businessman and he regards people in wall street as sharks who are after his money it seems strange background to go public, I have to say. You know, you're selling shares to those same sharks. I agree. And, and the other thing about him is he never, ever owned a single share in a public company until Piggly Wiggly stores went public. So he's, he sees himself as completely outside that world. God, the sharks must have seen him coming. Shortly after the flotation, basically, some franchisees of Piggly Wiggly go bust. And even though this is totally unconnected to the managed bit of his business, some people in Wall Street, a group of bears, they realise this is an opportunity to start a rumour about the fact that his business is in trouble. 
So they start shorting his shares. So they borrow some from the market and sell them to drive the price down. And basically, they put around a rumor that he's going bust. This starts to have an effect. The share price, which has been very stable since it's been floated, starts to drop. And Clarence, unsurprisingly, is a bit cheesed off and (laughs) smells a bit of dirty work at the crossroads. He announces in the press his intention to, quote, beat the Wall Street professionals at their own game. Oh, dear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's already go up for a fight. Uh, but he's quite well organized because he hires a very, very well-known speculator, broker, a man called Jesse Livermore, who's rather famous, actually, to orchestrate his campaign to defeat these shorts and get the share price back up. So Livermore is given some money by Clarence, which I think he borrows, and goes to work. And within, <laughs> within a week, he's bought up 100,000 of the 200,000 Piggly Wiggly shares outstanding. <laughs> and Good he's heavens. got the short, the Bear Raiders, a little bit anxious. And the shares start to go up again. <laughs> and at the same time, Saunders, who's a terrific propagandist, is going around putting adverts in the newspapers and giving press conferences where he, he gives an interview to some newspapers in the, in the South. And he says... Shall the gambler rule on a white horse he rides? Bluff is his coat of mail, and thus shielded is a yellow heart. My goodness, if then ever there was a sell (laughs) signal, that surely is it. His helmet is deceit, his spurs clink with treachery, and the hoofbeats of his horse shall thunder destruction. (laughs) Shall good business flee? Shall it tremble with fear? Shall it be the loot of the speculator? So you can see he's got his blood up. At this yeah. point. Was this a sort of trading update that he gave? <laughs> well, you have to remember that this is in the days before the Securities and Exchange Commission, as you'll discover from what happens next, because it, this is merely a kind of amuse-bouche for the fully-fledged fight that's to come. Anyway, so by this stage, he's basically bought almost all the shares, and the stock has shot up to an all-time high. And Saunders then does something rather interesting. He announces publicly that he's going to sell 50,000 shares, so a quarter of the company, at $55, which is below the market price, which he's driven the shares up to. And he announces it in full-page ads in the kind of local newspapers. (laughs) And the ads read, opportunity, opportunity, it knocks, it knocks, it knocks. Do you hear? Do you listen? Do you understand? Do you want? Do you act now? Has a new Daniel appeared and the lions eat him not? Has a new Joseph come that riddles may be made plain? Has a new Moses been born to the post? Oh, enough, enough. Why then, ask the sceptical, can Clarence Saunders be so generous to the public? So as you can see, if the SEC had existed, they might start to uh, <laughs> yeah. drop him a line at this point and ask him what on earth he's playing at, buying shares at $60 and offering to sell them back to the public at 55 I must say it's a much more attractive uh, story yeah, than, than <laughs> saying, as far as I can see, there is no reason for the drop in the share price. Our businesses are going OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 he's putting his money where his mouth is. This yeah. is a man of courage. But what's he up to here? Do you, can you think of what he's up to? Well, he's obviously squeezing the shorts. Yeah, and he's... he thinks that uh, at 55 bucks, they will capitulate or enough of them will capitulate. Well, no, he's actually, he's actually sussed out something which is actually the death of most cornerers, which is it's all very well buying up all the stock. But how do you offload it when you've bought the whole lot? And so what he's trying to do is he's trying to plan his exit before he gets stuck holding all the shares and trying to sell them back to the market. Why it's quite clever is what he does is he basically he's trying to sell them in a way that takes them out of the marketplace. So they can't be bought back by the speculators, by the bear raiders. Because what he does, he says in these newspaper advertisements, he says to the public, you, Neil, you can buy these shares at $55. But you have to pay an instalments over a year. And until you've paid the final instalment in roughly a year's time, I shall retain the certificate. And <laughs> so therefore, you can't sell the shares back to the market for another year. So he's very clever. He's basically financing the whole yeah. his, okay. his position with the people. I'm not surprised his uh, financial position by this point was getting rather stretched, I would I imagine. Think, I think that's a very, very perceptive <laughs> comment. And that is the other problem with cornering is basically it can be a very expensive exercise once you've bought shares very high prices. 
But one of the problems with this brilliant stratagem is it makes very clear to the New York Stock Exchange that he is basically trying to corner the shares in his own company. And they don't like it because they hate corners. Yeah. Do you know why they hate corners? Because it stops the market working and it disadvantages their friends. Those are all true. Even worse than that, there was this great folk memory on the New York Stock Exchange thing called the Great Northern Railroad Corner of 1901. Oh dear, do we need to go there as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, the, oh. the only thing we need to understand about the Great Northern Railway Corner of 1901 is that it was so successful and so destructive that all the shorts who had shorted the Great Northern Railroad, who were big players on the stock market, had to start selling all their shares to try and cover their losses. And it caused a massive market panic and the market collapsed. So the New York Stock Exchange don't like that. They start to get very, very medieval on Clarence Saunders at this point. And they do the thing which, if you are a, is total poison, which is they suspend the shares. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also they extend the deadline for settling the short covering. So the people who've shorted the shares have much longer to return the stock to Clarence Saunders than... This is this to. is a time-honoured practice by exchanges everywhere, whether it's stock exchange or commodity exchanges. Yeah. If it gets too far in one direction, yep. they change the rules against the person who yes. has uh, got the position. Absolutely right. And Clarence Saunders is utterly outraged. He can't believe they've done this to him. And he says, it is unbelievable to me that the august and all-powerful New York Stock Exchange is a Welsher. Therefore, I continue to believe that the shares of stock due to me on contracts will be settled on the proper basis. But that turns out to be completely hopeless. Well, of course, because they've changed the rules, yeah. which are, in the first case, arbitrary. And this becomes an issue. But in, in Memphis, of course, they all rally behind the local boy. And the Commercial Appeal, which is the local business paper, they say, this looks like what gamblers call Welshing. We hope the homeboy beats them to a frazzle. <laughs> At this point, it really does come apart. So Saunders gets into a total pickle. He has to cut his price dramatically to, to settle with the shorts. He is indeed left with huge debts, which he can't basically cover. In the meantime, what's happened to the business? So the business is fine. Sometime in early 1923, so exactly 100 years ago this is happening. In early 1923, the company posts its results, record figures, all going really well. There's absolutely nothing wrong with Piggly Wiggly stores. But Clarence has not only borrowed lots and lots of money, he's also, I think, got a bit muddled as to what uh, belongs to the company and what belongs to him. How familiar this is. <laughs> so hard to keep them and that's apart. that's one of the problems. That's one of the problems. So anyway, mid-1923, Piggly Wiggly goes bust, mainly because of the debts which Clarence has uh, put on the business. The actual underlying business is fine. He disappears stage left. It gets recapitalized. And weirdly, it still exists. If you go to the Midwest of the United States, you'll still find there are Piggly Wiggly stores and you can Aww. go into them. So um, a sort of happy ending of well, sorts. Well, not really completely over. So well, Clarence well, licks his wounds and he's not finished yet. He starts a new chain in 1928 called Clarence Saunders, sole owner of My Name Stores, Inc. <laughs> 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 Which becomes known as My Name Stores. But that goes bust in the Great Depression. But he's still not finished. In the, after the... After the war, he sets up a last chain called Caduzel. And Caduzel is, once again, a fantastically innovative idea. It's basically a self-service supermarket where you get a kind of key. There's no, there are almost no people in the thing at all. And you go around these closed cabinets and open them with your key, and it records what you've taken out. And God, so if you, only but, it had the but, internet. But you know why it didn't work? Yeah, I know. Do you know it didn't work? People stole the keys? No, it's too expensive to build. Oh. Yeah, I think they opened about two stores, and then he dies in 1953. There are rule changes, obviously, in the 1930s, which mean you could never do a corner as he had done one. No. I mean, Others, of course, have tried since in different areas, but not in, well, not in the stock, stock market. market. So those, but what I thought, you know, you still see, even though it's a totally uh, mad and destructive thing, a corner in the stock market, you couldn't do it now because obviously the rules would make you have to make a bid for a company if you got more than X percent of the shares. But it's still amazing how exciting, you know, with GameStop, the huge amount of attention about that sort of thing with its yeah. Robin Hood overtones. It's part of the show, but the, what the people who are trying these things on never understand is that the rules are made by 
the runners of the market, whether it's a stock market or a commodities market or something else, and they can always change them without notice. That's and true. then you are stuffed. Although he did, there's one last thing to say about Clarence Orders. He embarrassed the stock exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, because two years later, they didn't do anything at the time, but two years later, they quietly acknowledged that they had acted in a very high-handed way. They could obviously suspend shares if they wanted to, but they, they couldn't change the delivery times for settling shares, which they did in his specific case. Mm. So they amended their constitution to give themselves that power which sort of reflected the fact that they knew they had slightly pushed it. But anyway, Clarence Saunders, what a guy. <laughs> Piggly, <laughs> Piggly Wiggly, Wiggly Storms. I want to go and see What a I'm great gonna, business. Next time I'm in the Midwest, I'm going to go to a Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> well, best of luck. That was A Long Time in Finance with Jonathan Ford and Neil Collins. Production and editing by Nick Hilton and our sponsorship partner is briefcase.news. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review it on your podcast app as that will help new listeners find us.